Good morning, um, everybody, and uh, thank you so much for uh, having me here with you today, uh, despite uh, the time difference uh, and the geographical difference that uh, COVID-19 has caused uh, among us today. So my name is Chiara Daraio, and I'm a professor of mechanical engineering and of applied physics uh, at Caltech. And my work uh, is uh, primarily focused on the design of new materials with uh, different properties and functionalities that span from the mechanical domain to the electrical and um, uh, sensing domain. In the talk uh, I'm going to be discussing with you today, I'll be um, I'll be presenting some of our research, uh, um, recent research on uh, organic temperature and um, IR sensors. The work started um, a few a few years ago when uh, we began exploring um, some interesting properties of um, the plant universe, and in particular, uh, we were fascinated by discovering the properties that plants have. Like in this picture here, um, you're seeing the image of a maple tree in detecting environmental temperature changes by uh, varying the ionic conductivity in um, in their tissues. In this interesting paper that was published in the 1960s in the Canadian Journal of Botanist, two botanists that performed experiments by placing electrodes on the branches of a maple tree, nails in fact, um, three feet apart and studied how the response uh, um, of the system, in fact the resistant changes between these electrodes were affected by variations in the temperature of the environment. And these are the results that were reported in that uh, Canadian paper where, uh, as you can see here, the maple tree resistance response was varying um, by orders of magnitude as a function of the external environmental temperature. And the botanists could not really explain the mechanisms of um, conduction. They only hypothesized that the role of ions within the tissues was an important factor in determining this responsivity um, within uh, um, in the electrical uh, resistance of plant uh, plant tissues. So we were fascinated by this and uh, um, a few years ago we started exploring what component of the plant uh, uh, tissues was responsible for this high temperature sensitivity and we started testing first uh, um, plant cells and then breaking down the plant cells, we were exploring what component within the plant cells was playing this important role in temperature sensitivity. And after excluding layer by layer all the elements in the uh, plant cell walls, we settled on one important structure that's probably well known to all of you if you're interested in cooking or you are, um, for example, um, you've ever tried to make jam or marmalade at home, which is pectin. Pectin is a um, structure that um, it's effectively a, a sugar that's present ubiquitously in the plant uh, uh, cell wall structure of all plants and it's mostly found in different types of fruits and has a very complex structure that I'm showing on this slide uh, up here. The structure consists of a main chain uh, of uh, homogalacturonic um, or polygalacturonic acids that you see in orange on the structure above. And there's a number of side chains that function as uh, uh, structural uh, um, and other um, uh, ad additive groups. However, um, this type of polyelectrolyte turns out to be a very particular polymer, uh, polymer structure which hides uh, its uh, um, secret temperature responsivity in the backbone. The backbone of galacturonic acid is characterized by an egg box structure that you see depicted in this schematic diagram, which um, we identified to be responsible for the temperature responsivity um, observed in plant cells. So this uh, uh, egg box structure is going to become very important uh, in the um, continuation of the story I'm, I'm about to tell you. When we identified pectin to be um, the molecule responsible for temperature sensitivity, we proceeded in testing pure pectin and pectin hydrogel as the active principle for temperature responsivity and tried to create a thermistor or thermometer just using um, pectin hydrogels that you see here are composed by pectin, uh, bought commercially uh, and cross-linked by calcium chlorides in water dehydrated and coated with a layer of PDMS to prevent uh, the influence of uh, environmental humidity or water. 
So the thermistor you see in this picture was then connected to a circuit and the resistance was measured in a way very similar to the experiments that were done on the maple tree I told you before as a function of variations of temperature in the room. And you can see that like in the case of the maple tree observations, the resistance was varied, uh, varies a lot as a function of the temperature variations between 80 and 40 degrees. Interestingly, um, pectin films in air have also a similar temperature responsivity to the thermistor I showed before. And when compared to other references in the literature that report on uh, um, flexible temperature um, sensing films or thermometers, you see that they have a response that uh, orders of magnitude superior that's indicated by the slope of these curves uh, in, uh, in temperature variations um, that is significantly superior to any of the existing literature or um, reported literature or, um, or commercial thermometers in use today. We hypothesized that uh, the reason for this responsivity is related to the ion hopping or higher mobility that's increased when the temperature is increasing with a mechanism that's similar to the unzipping me mechanism of uh, the zipper of a jacket. However, the complete characterization of this ionic response to temperature is still um, under investigation. To look at the limits of the temperature response of the spectin films, we compared their reading to the um, temperature reading of a thermal camera, which you see here um, with, the, with the picture taken on the, on the right. And you can see that the pectin film, that's a top picture on the left, are very transparent. Now, if you compare the readout in blue on these lower curves of our pectin films as compared to the temperature reading of a thermal camera, you see that they're highly correlated even when we compare regions of the plots um, that look like uh, measurement noise while in this ellipse uh, shown here, while the correlation between the thermal camera and the temperature sensor remains uh, quite high. So from here, we speculate that pectin in air without uh, um, additional variations on the composition can detect on the order of uh, um, 10 millikelvin um, in a, with a very simple electrical circuit, like you see here, um, just two crocodile electrodes connected to a multimeter, multimeter reading device. Interestingly, pectin um, behaves uh, somewhat like paper, so it is bendable and the bending or mechanical solicitation does not affect the temperature reading. However, it's not very stretchable. We have thought of pectin as being um, a useful organic uh, um, compound that could be used, for example, in wearable devices to monitor temperature on the skin or to develop wearable thermometers. However, for fulfilling such applications, we need to make it more stretchable. And in the past, we have explored the use of plasticizers such as glycerol to enhance the stretchability and the elongation at break of these systems. And as you can see here, uh, there's optimal amount of glycerol contents that, for example, between three and 5% that indeed enhances the elongation at break of pectin films uh, um, while reducing the Young's modulus and tensile strength. Um, but they come at a significant cost to the responsivity, responsivity related to the increased water intake or water uptake due to the hydrophilic interaction between glycerol and, uh, and water. So the expecting as plasticizers effectively uh, increases the amount of water shorting the circuit and uh, unfortunately significantly affect the average uh, um, thermal response, which is the diagram you see on the plot D. Um, suggesting that although the use of plasticizers could improve the mechanical response, it is not ideal because it reduces the response to temperature. The use of pectin uh, also comes with issues and concerns. For once, pectin is extracted by, uh, from different types of fruits and different pat uh, batches of pectin come with different properties such as esterification and different molecular structures. So we have issues in uniformity and reproducibility, but also issues and concerns related to fabrication. In all of the devices I showed you so far, we've used basically direct drop casting method, which often leads to bubble formation, delamination and electrode ripoff that again, 
um, causes, uh, uh, for example, um, ununiformity in the measurements and difficulties in calibration. Of course, these are all issues that are uh, clearly present because we are using natural products that are not uh, uh, easily controllable. So in our uh, research, we started to think about how to solve the problem by taking inspiration from uh, uh, from the uh, from the pharmaceutical industry that has been doing um, similar steps uh, in the past. So in the pharmaceutical in industry, for example, it is common to identify active principles such as salicin in uh, the willow tree that are responsible for certain properties or abilities such as reducing fevers or inflammation, and then um, isolate it to produce it efficiently and targeted it in a synthetic uh, laboratory. So we asked ourselves, is it possible to create pectin um, analogs in a synthetic polymer by reproducing the motifs of these uh, egg box structure that we identified to be responsible for the temperature sensitivity? And in this slide here, I'm highlighting the egg box structure in more details, showing two fundamental components of the egg box uh, um, that uh, determine the interaction with the divalent uh, calcium ions responsible for the temperature sensitivity which are the hydroxyl uh, and carboxylic groups. So we decided to create an analog structure that you see here, creating an ABA tri-block copolymer using a solvent ethanol, which is composed of three parts. Um, the A part is a polyacrylic acid, which uh, functions as a divalent, uh, divalent cat cation binding site. And the B part that you see in the middle is polybutyl acrylate, which is added for uh, mechanical stability. And you can see that in the synthetic analog, we also reproduce these hydroxyl and carboxylate groups to interact with calcium ions. Interestingly, when we compare the response of pectin and our so-called P3 ABA polymer, you see in red and blue on the diagram on the left, that the two responses match quite well, showing that it is indeed possible to create synthetic analogs of pectin for uh, uh, electronic devices in a more controlled and stable way. In fact, when we change the cations type and species from calcium, for example, to cobalt or iron, we can achieve temperature responsivi responsivity, which is up to 2.5 times better than the pectin films alone. And the B part of this polybutyl acrylate I mentioned before, uh, right in the middle here, allows us to increase functionalities by adding flexibility and stretchability to the system, which were not present before uh, when only pectin was, uh, 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 was used to produce these films. So in order to understand better the responsivity of this new synthetic P3 ABA polymers, we use attenuated total refractance uh, FTIR spectroscopy to examine the film formation and behavior. And notice that, for example, after five minutes of deposition, the solvent the ethanol was quickly removed and the characteristic structure of the film in a stable state was uh, um, achieved around uh, about an hour after uh, um, the film uh, was deposited. An important question that we're still trying to answer is how much water is optimal? As I mentioned before, when we dealt with glycerol, the amount of water can affect significantly the electrical response of these um, uh, polyelectrolytes. And so we need to establish the optimal amount uh, during dehydration. And we have performed the TGA analysis, like you see here, to um, try to distinguish components from the ga gas phase diffusion and uh, the uh, composite degradation steps. The characterization of the polymer response was, was performed both in AC and DC circuits. Um, and we saw that, in fact, these systems are not just sensitive to temperature, like you see on the left hand side, um, but also to the level of hydration. So by performing tests of uh, reading currents, uh, RMS currents in this case, uh, with the controlled humidity and temperature environmental conditions, we can determine curves that can decouple the humidity reading from the temperature reading. 
And more interestingly, um, it's also interesting to note that the response, the RMS current response varies not just as a function of temperature, but also as a function of the frequency of the voltage that's used as input, which is another element that could be used in the electronic device readout systems, for example, to enhance further the sensitivity and responsivity of the systems. So we're currently exploring the possibility to create devices, for example, for temperature mapping with these uh, uh, P3 ABA polymers, obtaining responses that are quite stable over a large number of cycles, as you see here, and to uh, responses, for example, for wearable systems that are isolated or independent of pressures, um, for example, from a finger or from stepping on them. And we are designing mapping devices that can reconstruct continuous uh, um, uh, temperature maps, for example, on flat or curved surfaces. But we're also using these P3 ABA polymers as pixels for perhaps the future IR camera reading. And in this preliminary data you see on the slide, I'm showing the uh, response of our P3 ABA polymer to IR radiation when deposited as a single pixel on an electrode thin film. And you can see that it is possible to see variations of the RMS current reading across the electrodes when different IR powers uh, are used to excite the polymer at different wavelengths. And this responsivity can, um, in the future, be extended, for example, by creating more complex compounds or uh, um, different composite polymeric materials uh, that, for example, enhance the absorptivity at different wavelengths. So I hope that in the last uh, 15 minutes or so, I've been able to convince you that plants and plant components are a promising resource uh, for engineering materials, uh, starting from something as common as pectin, um, it is possible to create a synthetic polymer of ABA type for, uh, for electronic uh, devices and potentially commercial um, uh, consumer electronic systems. And with this, I'd like to um, acknowledge uh, the, uh, again, the organizer, particularly uh, Uliana Shimanovic, who is also uh, one of the collaborators uh, in this project all the students and postdocs that have contributed to acquiring the results I described so far, and the funding, um, which came primarily from uh, uh, Samsung and the schwartz Reisman Foundation um, these days. I'd be very happy to entertain questions, and unfortunately, I cannot do this live for the time difference, but please do email me. Um, I'm uh, usually quite responsive, and I'd be happy to meet on Zoom or in other ways to um, uh, to continue discussions and uh, uh, respond to comments and suggestions. And my email is at the bottom of these slides. Thank you again, and I hope to see you in person soon. Bye.